Hello, welcome. I'm Drew Hornbein, and I am here with a group of wonderful people, and we are about to listen to uh, Deacon explain a uh, a thing called favor. Do you want to take it away, Deacon? Sure, I totally can. Um, so the idea here um, is not a new one. Um, it's, uh, it's an economic initiative, a type of economic initiative that usually gets implemented, at least in the beginning, during a time of crisis. And it's very grassroots. It's not the kind of thing that comes from a government. Um, and the, the idea is very simple. It's a credit clearing system. Um, and so it's, it's almost absurdly elegant. There are very, very few rules. It's like the game of Go. Um, uh, just everybody who's involved gets an account. Every account starts at zero. Um, you can't put central bank money in your account to make it not zero, it's just zero. Um, and by consensus, so in the case of the original Veer Bank, by consensus, all the members just determined each other's credit limits based on business size, capacity, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so that means you can go negative from zero um, because if everybody starts at zero, in order for anyone to spend any money, then they have to go negative. Um, but there's no interest on that, on that debt, which is the thing that makes it phenomenally different than the US dollar. Um, it's non-interest bearing debt. So you could be in debt, you know, um, your entire existence in the bank and fluctuate up and down towards zero. You're never really losing anything. Um, uh, not that necessarily anybody should aim to, to always be in the negative, but it almost doesn't matter. Um, and that's more or less the entire system. Um, there's a lot more thinking behind it and there, are a lot of reasons that there aren't any other mechanics. And usually that's where the conversations go, is why is the system so incredibly elegant? Um, is It's actually very suspicious to people. <laughs> um, but that's, that's the basic idea, so. Awesome, well, thanks for everyone for being on the call today. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's, start, um, let's start with a little history lesson, Deacon, and can you, you, you mentioned Veer Bank, but can you give us a, a little Absolutely. background on what Veer Bank is? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, Switzerland, which was neutral in both uh, world wars, um, uh, was still very impacted. It's a fairly small country and, and uh, a lot of, especially the larger businesses there, they had clients in Germany, Austria, France, um, in Italy. Uh, so the, uh, the business in, in Switzerland was just as impacted. It, it, the whole European economy was decimated by the First World War. And then uh, on the heels of the First World War, the U.S. Great Depression um, actually also hit Europe for, some, for the same re <clears throat> reasons, more or less, that um, European countries have U.S. clients and vice versa, and we're, we're all connected. I think that's a, the thing that everybody's learned pretty thoroughly at this point, is we're all very connected. Um, and so uh, there are a few businesses. In the beginning, it was just two people, but they very quickly found two other members. Um, so there were, for the first decade of the Veer Bank's existence, there were only four members, but those four members included one of the biggest construction companies in Switzerland and um, some other manufacturing company. And so they're all kind of like big players, but they all had big accounts with each other. Um, and so they looked at what was happening with the Swiss franc and it was not stable and it was declining very rapidly and it was hurting them a lot. And so they instantiated this system um, just to, you know, to be able to have a stable pool of exchange that they had access to. And so for 10 years, it was just four of them. And then they started letting other members in by consensus, inviting people in one at a time. Um, there are now 62,000 members in the Veer Bank, um, all businesses. So that one is only B2B. Um, it's no longer <clears throat> run by a consensus of all members because that would be unwieldy. Um, there's an administrative body um, and you know it's gotten a little bit more complicated, but the basic principle uh, remains pretty much the same. Cool. So I want to start opening up questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you another question, but if folks start having uh, questions and want to drop it into the chat, 
um, I think that might be a good way to start to field some of these things. Uh, why don't you share with us um, a brief vision of what this would look like in our current situation, in our current context. Um, yeah, right now. Right. Excellent. Um, there are a lot of uh, little examples of how it could be put to use immediately. Um, so for instance, <clears throat> let's say that the, <clears throat> the needs and offerings list is looked at by a group of people. And there are <clears throat> a number of people who have things they would like to offer, but as things are, things are tightening down, they would prefer to offer those things in exchange. They'd prefer to sell them or they would um, like some kind of barter or whatnot. But it's really hard to have like a, a pure two-party barter system. If I've got, <clears throat> I can do graphic design, sorry, I've been talking a lot. <clears throat> and um, I could do graphic design for somebody and they could do, um, they could, you know, knit a sweater. Um, and it's like, ah, I'm not really in the market for a sweater right now, but this sweater knitter who used to just sell at a local event that doesn't happen anymore would really like a, a new site with some graphics and things like that. So they want something that I have, but I don't really want what they have, but somebody else does. It gets kind of tricky. And so we're, we've got this growing list of offers and, and needs, but there aren't going to be a whole lot of perfect matches. Even if you get two people that are offering or needing what the other have, they're not necessarily going to need them in like in equal proportion. <clears throat> and if the proportion's off and, <clears throat> and dollars are, are in shortage, um, uh, then that exchange gets tense and, and uh, that imbalance creates either resentment or it, or it creates a situation where people don't exchange their goods and services, which means people's needs aren't being met. Um, and so that's kind of the problem we're, we're potentially facing, or we're definitely facing, but potentially facing an increasing degree. So there's a credit clearing system with multiple people in it. That person who does graphic design just does the graphic design for the person who needs it, who knits sweaters, and they get credits. You know, they go positive in the system, the sweater knitter goes negative in, in this credit system. Um, and then somebody who wants a sweater, you know, gets a sweater, the sweater knitter goes back up positive, the person who needs a sweater goes, goes negative, um, and it just goes around. So it, in that way, it could be seen as um, uh, essentially a, uh, sort of an analog for um, nonlinear barter would be one way of looking at it. But when you have nonlinear barter that gets uh, turned into units and measured, that's money. So that's just commerce. Um, so does that make sense? Uh, yeah, but break, I'm a, I'm a little slow. Break it down uh, for me uh, a little bit further is, uh, or let me reflect it to you. It's each of us, if we all join this system right now on the call, each of us would get a, a credit limit and then we could spend this money. If we all, say we all have a 200 favor credit limit, we spend this uh, made up money to exchange services with each other. I give you a hundred credits um, for graphic design. I give Asia a hundred credits for a tincture. And then uh, both you and Asia now have a uh, hundred credits plus your 200 credit limit. And, you, and then and we're just moving this all around, but ultimately all of the people in the group, if we add up our, our, our account, it comes out to zero. Correct. <coughs> that is correct. Great. Uh, is there any other, um, uh, well, let's, let's, Caroline just dropped a question. Caroline, do you wanna just uh, share your question with us? Sure, I dropped a few questions, um, so please take them one at a time or whatever makes sense. Um, but uh, who would be the original team you're proposing that would use this currency? What would be the scope of that? And um, you mentioned consensus in the weird currency. How does that relate to the structure here? Um, 
and then what resources are required to start this, what best practices should we know about as far as operating and expanding once it's um, a thing? <laughs> those are some questions. Yeah, those are all excellent questions. And, and it's actually very helpful that you've read them out loud for the sake of video and posterity and written them down so that <laughs> they can be answered one at a time. Um, so thank you. Um, the original team, um, so the things that I described are things that are very time tested and basically like knowns. More or less everything else is an open question, if that makes sense. Like there are like some pretty hard economic limits um, in terms of how the system works. And people have tried many variations on this and and most of the variations have, have pitfalls. So those things I described are like knowns. So um, I'm actually kind of proposing some deviations because I don't think that it's gonna solve our current crisis to only have four members for a decade, right? Um, that doesn't, doesn't move the needle for very many people. Um, and so we have to make a few things up. Um, so I've tapped uh, for the, that core team people who I see as having like veteran organizing um, experience. Um, so I invited Kaylin Heffernan. Um, Kaylin has been very busy and we haven't been able to have that conversation in full. Um, and I was hoping that she would be able to make it. Does, does everybody know Kaylin? I know, hi Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca probably doesn't know Kaylin, but for everybody else in Denver, do you know Kaylin? She ran for mayor. Um, hey. Do you oh, like my you shirt? Got a shirt on right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I was hoping to invite, you know, some of my other co-facilitators I've been working with a lot in the, the Permaculture Guild. Uh, Drew, who is um, right now the benevolent dictator of Better Together, which is moving towards um, uh, member ownership. Uh, Asia and Adam, <clears throat> who both have you know, organizing experience within the Denver Permaculture Guild and related um, activities and projects. Um, and then actually I was ultimately hoping that once the system is designed and all of the, like, the economics points have been like fully fleshed out that I would actually possibly not be on that committee. Um, uh, but that's kind of an, an open question as well. Um, so that's that's the first question. Any direct direct responses or follow up questions to that? I guess I I have a question about why um, organizers per se would be chosen instead of like the the business community or just the how you went about like choosing who should be on the thing. Um, a part of it is definitely proximity and experience with these folks. Um, uh, the the reason I wouldn't reach out to business people is that I mean, the economics and the mechanics are the part that shouldn't change. Um, the things that are going to the big questions that have to be handled are actually very human interpersonal questions and they're organizer questions like uh, credit limits. How do they move? How do they grow? You know, who gets to, um, you know, are we looking at um, you know, business plans to determine credit limits or something else. Um, also, what do we do about default? Um, we're looking at a time, and this is, you know, somewhat macabre, but like, we're looking at a time where people are going to die. Like, some number of the people that are affected by this crisis are, are not gonna be around in a year. And not to say that it's the biggest issue with that, but um, they, if, you know, somebody dies with the credit you know, their credit balance in the system is gonna be positive or negative and both of those present, um, you know, a question. And so dealing with that, absorbing that into the system to try to keep it at zero balance, um, <coughs> uh, preventing people from having duplicate, duplicate accounts. Do we need to take a 1099? I'm in another uh, barter network um, that, you know, it just, it's also all B2B. Um, every business signs up in you know 1099s, but if we're right now, if if this if it's decided that this system is going to be most of most use to like undocumented people who might be really worried about handing over information to like a grassroots group, maybe we don't want a 1099 everybody. Um, 
and then that raises you know other questions so it's it's things like that that are decisions that you know people who have been working with um you know uh helping immigrants helping the uh the dispossessed are used to a lot of the consequences of a lot of these decisions and factors um those are the decisions that will need to be made um and they're going to be uh, necessary compromises. So I definitely don't want anybody for whom it's their first organizing rodeo um, to be in that committee because um, when it's your first time on a big project, you don't want to compromise a circumstance. You don't want to let anybody down. You don't want to make a decision, you know, for which there are some structural winners and losers. Um, but those decisions have to be made, otherwise everybody loses. Um, so I'm hoping to pull together a pool of people who can make tough calls is my desire. So I guess just one follow-up clarification on why not involve the business community. Um, one of the big reasons would be like, in a nutshell, conflicts of interest. Is that accurate? I want, do want to separate involvement from tapping for steering committee, right? So like definitely want any number of local businesses as members, right? Um, but in terms of tapping for steering committee, um, yeah, not that. Um, depending on the business, I don't know that there would be a conflict of interest. I mean, like I'm a business owner. Um, Adam's a business owner. Asia's a business owner. <laughs> Caroline's a business owner. <laughs> Drew's a, actually, everybody that I've tapped is a business owner. So, um, uh, even Kaylin, Kaylin's a business owner. So, um, it's, yeah, but none of us are like necessarily people who are thought of by the Denver Post as the business community. Um, actually, none of us are. Absolutely, none of us would ever be called that by like, you know, the business as usual world. Um, I've added a few more questions into the chat. Um, would you like me to read them? Sure. I don't even think we got partway through your last list. I know. <laughs> Great questions. Thank you. Um, yep. Did anybody have any follow up on that steering? Like the steering committee thing is still like, this is kind of a system with right now a pseudo benevolent pseudo dictator, um, or maybe mostly benevolent pseudo dictator, because there's as yet nothing to be like in charge of. And I'm hoping by the time there is a something, I'm not in charge of it, if that makes sense. Um, and so um, in terms of decisions on these things, it's just like, I've just got ideas and I'm putting them out there and I'm gonna see what sticks, um, if that makes sense. Uh, if something is to form of this though, I think it would be helpful given your background in this material to help guide us through the, some of the policy and rule considerations around the currency. Like if you can help frame those questions to be answered or dilemmas or whatever um, for the steering committee, that would be super helpful. Of course, of course. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm definitely not planning on disappearing. I think that my role in the entity will probably be mostly like messaging, um, creating, actually like creating publicly all of those things that would be necessary for what you're talking about. Um, so that it's not just people on the inside who understand how it works and what's going on, but it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to, anybody who wants to, to look at it and understand it. Um, uh, so your next question is what resources are required to instantiate this? Very few, which is really cool. Um, uh, right now, mostly we need um, a, um, <clears throat> a prototype backend, which Drew has agreed um, that he's capable of and interested in, in producing. Um, you know, uh, if circumstances allow, um, that back end will, the back end we're planning on using, we've talked about it, is not going to scale um, very large. It's not gonna be a, a great long-term back end, but it'll be a great back end for thousands and thousands of transactions, um, but not like tens of thousands of transactions probably. Am I speaking correctly, Drew? I think so, I mean, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, we could, we could definitely, do a zero zero balance ledger technically pretty pretty easy yeah to prototype um and uh, it'll also need a front end which i technically could do but probably i'm not the best person to do 
Um, so that could be, we could tap somebody else from the tech committee, or it could also just be Drew and I cobbling together. I could find someone else. I've got a lot of front end people. So, you know, it'd be a web application. Um, I want to, this is a personal desire. This is not a, a necessity of the system, but I would really like to make it SMS interfaceable. Like, uh, like you should be able to transact through text message. Um, so that even people with like, you know, remember the, the free Obama phone that some people still have. If like, if you had any government assistance, you could get a free phone, but it's like a flip phone. Um, like anyone with just that much technology should be able to interface with this system. So it's not, um, so there's no gatekeeping in terms of technology. Um, I would very much like to see that that's going to take a little bit more development. Um, uh, but in terms of getting it off the ground, it could be operational in, you know, in less than a week. Um, so one, one of the, her, one of the resources needed though is organizing capacity to define what this is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and from a technical standpoint, it could be off. Like actually mm -hmm. um, what I should say is the technical hurdle is not the biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a few core decisions to be made. Like, who is holding this and committing to holding it indefinitely? Um, without that, the technical hurdle is possibly meaningless because um, if there's not community integrity in me holding it alone, um, and I'm not gonna do that again. And for full disclosure, this is not my first community, like local organizing currency or economic initiative. Um, and so, uh, the, the previous one I was a part of had not, it wasn't just me, but it was too few people at the core um, and some informal structures that led to breakdown. And I don't want any informal hierarchies, any informal authority, um, that, that kind of stuff is, just gets toxic really fast. So absolute transparency and clarity on, on who has say. Um, uh, what best practices should we be aware of about operating and expanding this model? Um, I started, I actually did start some documentation uh, for this um, and I got uh, some domains. I've got favor.solutions, which I'm really stoked on. Um, and then because some like new weird top level domains are still uh, strange for people, I also got favorsolutions.org. Um, but uh, at favor solutions, I've got some of the, like I've got, you know, the key mechanics, and I'm starting to pencil in best practices and um, example applications, but it's still pretty rudimentary. Um, uh, the biggest uh, best practice to be aware of that's counterintuitive for people is not to make decisions based on need. That's the thing that's hard for people. Um, like credit limits should not be assigned based on need. Um, you know, uh, credit by the organization should not be given, things shouldn't be done based on need. Um, it'll tank the system, it'll destroy and, and collapse the, the structure. Um, that's the whole economic thing on that. But um, yeah, aside from that, the best practices are just the, those key mechanics that were described earlier. Um, oh man, so, Caroline, so many questions, so many good questions, hold on. Uh, Take your time, and I don't mean to dominate the space. I, I'm just, I'm going to post well, it in Does anybody have any follow-up questions yeah. on that have been asked by Carolyn and Carolyn and Annette uh, answered so far? So. One kind of question I have, if we're not going to make decisions based on need, then like how, how do we take in, how do we take need into account, I guess is my question. Yeah, so, um, and when I say the, the making decisions based on need, I mean the steering committee. Um, mostly when it's looking at like, so the steering committee should not have any power to, to give, um, to like move credit between accounts, right? Like the actual, um, the, the currency, um, what the steering committee can, can a lot is credit limits, right? So it can look at somebody coming in and say like, oh, you own a restaurant that is now closed, so you can benefit a lot from being in the system because it provides you know, immediate credit services and access to another kind of exchange. And your kitchen can still be used as a uh, commissary 
for these personal chefs and you're not really set up to be a personal chef and, and you know, there are hours when it's down. And so um, that person can come in and you can reasonably give them a pretty substantial credit limit because of their capacity, right? Um, if somebody came in and was um, like, you know, their landlord's not getting on the, the you know, rent, um, like a, was it the rent strike train and they lost their job because they worked in that restaurant and, um, and they've got kids and they've got all this stuff and they are, have serious need and you give them the same credit limit. Let's say you give them, you know, a 50,000 favor credit limit. Well, that person doesn't have the capacity to necessarily return that you haven't, you haven't given them any money. You've given them the capacity to go into debt. Um, and so if you just give someone like essentially a $50,000 worth of debt capacity and they can't return that value into the total system, then you've just created, it's like just tying a heavy rock to the system and just dropping it into the ocean. Like the whole system just like gets a little bit um, more dragged down because this person will be able to take a lot of things um, from the system, but not necessarily be able to return them. Now, um, by contrast to that, if this person comes to the system and says like, hey, I have all this need, and the steering committee says, hey, there are people that we know who just wanna help people, and they will give you favors, right? Well, if you give someone, um, a, if someone just gives currency, then that person spends the currency, and no rock got dropped into the ocean because it moved, it kept moving. But if you just give someone a really deep credit limit and they spend the credit limit, then the movement ceases. It doesn't keep going. It, it just, the, the spend, it just went one way. So individual people can give that person money. And maybe even like groups can be created and the steering committee can help create groups that do philanthropic work. But the, but the steering committee needs to hold the space for just the responsibilities it has, which are plenty. Um, and I'm, so I'm not saying that people shouldn't be generous and give within the system. It's that the, for the authority the steering committee has, which is over credit limits, uh, uh, an outsized credit limit is not a gift, is essentially the reason for that. Um, so that's kind of a weird, nuanced economic thing. Did that, was that a helpful explanation? Should I work on that explanation? It's like a real credit card. Having a $5,000 credit limit, if you don't have the ability to pay it back, isn't helpful. Yeah, it's not helpful to you. It's also, it's not helpful to the economy, ultimately, to, to the group of the whole network, um, so. Yeah, I, I think the, the explanation uh, really made sense for me with the people can give favor, but giving credit isn't, isn't useful. Um, can you speak to Asia's question on uh, how this differs from a traditional bank with the exception of interest? So interest is the bedrock of, of central banking. And this is one of the things that when I was organizing for Kojax, I found um, uh, was, so okay, when I learned how banking works, which was actually um, in the Sherwood Project days, which was not specifically a finance organization. It was a sustainability, sustainability modeling organization. I started studying economics there to understand sustainability modeling better, but we were mostly gardening. Um, and then a couple of years later, several years later, I went out to do this local business organizing thing and started talking to people about how banking worked. And I had actually thought that I was silly for not knowing how the Fed you know, distributes money to commercial banks, which, uh, you know, distribute money to smaller commercial banks. And, um, but the, then I learned that basically it's, it's very, it's very uncommonly understood what interest really is and does to uh, the economy. Um, so all money is issued at interest bearing debt, even from the Fed to the four banks that own the Fed, which is really weird but that's how it works. And then they make loans to smaller banks. And then those smaller banks make loans to businesses and individuals. 
And every one of those loans incurs interest. <clears throat> and so the cost for issuing $1 is actually about $3, sometimes more, depending on the dollar. Um, so like, you know, with home loans, it's about $3 and those are pretty big. Um, with student loans, it can be a little bit less, a little bit more, depending on how long you take to pay them off. Credit card debt, it's a lot more. Credit card debt, um, that's all brand new money. As soon as you swipe a credit card, that money never existed before. And the average, uh, like, repay, total repayment cost for $1 created on, by uh, using a credit card is about $5. Um, so um, that, you know, that interest piece is enormous. It's everything. So if there is no other difference, it doesn't, like, that's the only difference you need. Because right now in the central bank denominated economy, there are, there's more than an order of magnitude, more debt than there is credit. There's more debt than dollars in total existence. If everybody, all the, if all the wealthiest people in the world, all the billionaires, all the millionaires, went out and started paying off debt. If they paid off their own debt, because uh, a lot of them actually have debts, and that's a, a thing that is like, super weird, but they paid off their own debt, and then they went to pay off any other person's debt. And they all paid off all the debts they could pay off. And then it went down to you know, the you know, more successful business owners that aren't as rich, and they paid off all the debt that they could. And then it went down to poor people, and they paid off all the debt that they could. There would still be more debt. Countries would be in more debt, people would be in more debt, than money had ever been issued because that's how much debt there is. And that's what interest does. And that's why there's all this pressure on society. That's why people make decisions against their best interests, their long-term interests against other people, against their relationships is because the pressure that's created uh, by interest incentivizes um, hasty, poor decision-making, creating externalities, all these different things. It's just too much. Um, so in this system where there is that pressure is absent um it changes a lot of dynamics for exchange it allows people to um share things and and be compensated uh for sharing those things that they ne wouldn't necessarily otherwise um be able to be compensated for and so what that could mean for um for a, a small economy is that we keep circulation moving and keep people active and getting needs met um in ways that couldn't be uh, done before. Does that make any sense? I'm, I'm sorry, I say, does that make any sense a lot? But I just, sometimes I realize that I'm kind of rambling and I'm just like, was that too much of a word dump? Did it <laughs> like? Yeah, I think, I think it landed. It, it has me really becoming attached to Caroline's um, questions about sort of the mission, the vision, the values, and um, particularly like who exactly we're trying to serve. Um, and if I'm seeing the same sort of, just the conversation about credit uh, felt like every conversation about credit. Um, and so it didn't seem <laughs> very alternative. The people who would have more success in the system are the people who have more credit. So for me, if we're clear about our target being um, maybe like middle income folks or, uh, you know, if we're really clear about who our target is, then I think uh, we won't have a lot of extra questions. But so th that's where I am is who is this going to serve? Um, right. And it's okay if it doesn't serve the most marginalized people, but we have to be clear of if our mission is to serve them or if our mission is to serve other segments of the economy. Yeah. I totally uh, agree with that. Absolutely. Um, so uh, the, the biggest economic thinker that I, I lean on really heavily is this guy, Calthelia, who's been dead for three millennia, <coughs> who he was the guy he was an old dude who wandered around India for a long time. And then, and he just observed people and talked to people. And one day he was talking to a young guy who was herding some cattle. And he thought this guy is super talented and he's, he's really young and he's passionate and he's really trying to do the best he can. I don't know how he observed this and this guy's herding of cattle. Um, but he, he took this young guy, um, and taught him everything that he had learned in all of his years and, and worked with him 
all the way through the rest of his life. Um, and uh, I think I actually I'll frequently forget the name of the young guy because it's it's Kautilya and his writings that have been mostly influential to me. But it's the guy who unified India, the the first unifier of India, and and India has been basically the same country since. So it's been three thousand years. Um, and uh, in terms of unification, it was actually one of the most bloodless imperialist expansions. I think the only one that compares is the Musa dynasty expansion. Um, and so the, the thinking, uh, the understanding of benevolent power that Kalthelia, Kalthelia had um, is immense. And a major part of his thesis was um, help the capable to extend your efforts. So the idea in terms of who to target is, I'm not saying we go out and we need to get like, like Warren Buffett or, you know, somebody who just, you know, Richard Branson, somebody who just cranks out, you know, you know, whatever they, they do. Um, but if we target people who are super productive and we give them a, a much better tool um, to make connections and solve problems, then those people can do the same. And then those people can do the same. And that's how you reach the most people most, the most effectively. Um, if a lot of systems for supposed social benefit and uplift go after the people that are hurting the absolute most and poor more energy into every one of them than it would take to provide for a whole block. You know, if you look at the resources that um, a shelter or a prison or a hospital or the paramedics put into um, just like the homeless, it is insane. And there are a lot of structural things that are wrong with that. But if you look just at like Denver Health, right? what Denver Health spends on one homeless person is more than they spend on most of their employees in a year. And that person still isn't housed, you know? It's, it's insane. And not, not just a little bit more, like many times more. Um, and that's why there's so much growing resentment between like paramedics and the homeless is because the paramedics see like, oh man, like I've got this frequent flyer that I know Denver Health has spent like a hundred thousand dollars on in the last couple of months, like, and and they're going home with fifty. You know, they're making like at you know Denver Health. It's the highest paid um, like paramedic service in the city. They're making like twenty bucks an hour, and and they're watching this happen. Well, that's not how you solve problems for a community. To solve problems for a community, we find somebody who's productive but doesn't have. Uh, an exchange resource to like like expand their production. Just to, to throw out an example. So let's just say we we take we find a chef. I've just been talking to chefs a lot because I'm working with the, the Denver Chefs Guild, and so I've got like kitchen on the brain. And obviously it's salient right now. So we find a shell a, a chef who um, you know a lot of restaurants are open right now, but they have to cut staff um, both for social for social distancing inside their facilities and because demand is greatly de decreased. So we, we find a chef who has no more work and we connect them to a kitchen through the favor. So they're paying for their space. So the restaurant is getting you know, a currency. It's not necessarily their preferred currency. Yeah, like everybody would rather have dollars because the pressure is greater on dollars, but they're getting something and they're using a resource that was otherwise just gonna be unused. And now the chef has a space where they can legally make food and for dis distribution, right? And we connect them with somebody who was a driver um, for like, you know, some service or uh, somebody who was doing anything that just can't work anymore. Um, and that person gets paid to do deliveries. And so now we've got this chef and we just built them a business. Let's say we find them, um, somebody who can build them a website. And so we just set up a whole like, um, you know, food production and distribution business for a person using this currency and then it exists and then they're making money in in both currencies and then they can pay their bills you know yeah so the target is people who 
have skills and need to be networked, uh, need their resources to be networked. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I know that having a more like granular uh, target would be helpful. Um, I'm usually the person saying that mantra that like it should be very uh, granular, but. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I feel like you are articulating your theory of change. Um, and it's, it's consistent with um, models of development that target the, the middle 50% versus the bottom or the top, the targeting sort of. Um, so yeah, thank you for answering yeah. that way. Though there's nothing in this that is, um, like there are a lot of people who are thought of as like the bottom, you know, whatever. And that's because we're looking at one pillar of capital, mm -hmm. right? There are a lot of people who are very, very poor who have amassed enormous capital. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Right. Um, and I wanted to bring up uh, the question in the chat, how much matchmaking between people does the steering committee do? Um, in the beginning, not necessarily the steering committee, but somebody would have to handhold probably all the transactions for a little while. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons I would like to, in an ideal world, not have a lot of responsibility on the steering committee, because I believe that I can uh, broker deals, um, hopefully, um, uh, work as a, as a go-between uh, for people to set up these kinds of arrangements, because in the beginning of a, a system like this, um, currency doesn't move by itself. You have to like prime the pump. Um, so, uh, and I wrote a bit about this on the, the site, it's, it's toward the end, but uh, essentially um, the system, if the system takes a 1% um, uh, fee from both sides to keep everything at zero in any exchange, that provides a bit for the system to continue working, but that doesn't cover like real brokerage. Um, but in the beginning, brokerage just has to be put into the system to get it moving. Um, and then it would have to be a compensated, it's work basically. So it has to be compensated eventually um, once things are moving. So what would be uh, what what would be the next steps? Call to action. Uh, the next steps. So <clears throat> uh, now we have this wonderful video. Which thank you, Drew, for putting this together. Um, and uh, we would I'll add this to the site, um, and I will further conversations with people that I would would really hope um, would have an interest in contributing time. Um, to, you know, hold uh, authority really in the system. Um, and if, if I can tap a, a decent, you know, body of people or, or tap people to tap people and maybe make that, that communication all happen, um, that's really the next thing that's needed. Um, I could use any feedback, um, any, any criticism, any, um, desires, hopes, dreams, um, further explanations, anything, the things that I'm kind of like rambling about, if somebody sees a clearer articulation or even just a, a better version of, and they could throw that out there, it really helps to have other people um, say things in a way that is accessible for other people. Um, but the biggest thing is really, um, getting a right now like the, the critical thing is finding a, a a small group of people you know like if there was a total of six that would take some responsibility um for um making basically making hard decisions um not contributing a lot of time but making hard decisions um when they have to be made that would be that's the next step well before we have a group ready to make hard decisions, I think there's still exploratory, like informational things that need to get taken care of. Um, there's out, some outstanding questions, for example. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, uh, and, and also I think, you know, 
the way this is being framed is that we're going to talk about um, this currency um, op option or this opportunity to structure things in this way. Um, and I wonder if this is complementary to other forms of organizing and other forms of community support. And so uh, I'm trying to understand more about this playing a role in shaping communities. And so um, anyway, yeah, yeah. so I, I, I don't know that. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'm just trying to that. Cart before the worst thing on that. Um, because you were saying there's more explore, exploration to do before forming a group of people to make decisions. And I'm saying the exact opposite has to be true. Like because the those decisions um, need to be made by a committed body of people who will put their reputation and, and some skin on in the game to hold to hold space for the consequences of those decisions. There isn't any point right. in anybody and, else how will, having how will, those, how will those people gel without um, any kind of understanding of the shared like purpose and value? And so steering committee is, yes, responsible for that exploration. Yeah, so, so there can be a tentative steering committee. You've already used that language. And so let's yeah, yeah. keep using it for sure. Um, but I just, yeah, there's, I feel like this conversation was too short. We need more oh, of this. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. a large part of the idea for this conversation was to, to document um, the, the idea, right? So, so now we've got, mm -hmm. we've got some written documentation. We've got a video document and this, uh, uh, hopefully will serve as, as something of a, an anchor, a thing that can be looked at that I can point to um, that, um, you know, will build momentum. Um, yeah. Great. And uh, time want to learn more. <laughs> Favor.solutions. That's a new TLD, whatever that means. Top Thank level everybody domain. for watching. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Drew.